Hello, and welcome back to The Barons. Today's video is going to be about the life and tragic death of Selena Quintanilla Perez. On April 16, 1971, a child was born that would shape the face of music forever. Selena Quintanilla Perez, born to Abraham Quintanilla, a Mexican-American, and Marcela Ophelia Quintanilla, a woman with Cherokee ancestry, arrived in Lake Jackson, Texas as a beautiful baby girl. She also had two older siblings, A.B. Quintanilla and Suzette Quintanilla. Her ability to sing was noticed by Quintanilla Jr. when Selena was only six. In People Magazine, he shared her timing, her pitch were perfect. I could see it from day one. She was taught English, but her father also taught her songs in Spanish, wanting her to relate to the Latino communities. After all, Abraham Quintanilla was a former musician himself. In 1981, she would play in her family's band, Selena y Los Dinos, as the lead singer when she was only 10. This band started with humble beginnings, playing for quinceañeras and on street corners, eventually playing at concerts that the father arranged for them. Her father eventually opened up a restaurant called Papagayos in Lake Jackson. The family band would perform there. As time went on, however, the family restaurant would fail when a recession hit in 1981 and forced the restaurant into foreclosure. Selena and her family moved to Corpus Christi and the restaurant finally went bankrupt. This sent Selena's family to move in with relatives. In order to focus on her career, Selena's father pulled her from school during her eighth grade year against the wishes of her former teacher. Selena did, however, finish high school in 1989 with the American School and enrolled at Pacific Western University. After her removal from school, the family bought a bus and began their journey through the musical world. They played for food and struggled with money. Yet things were starting to look up. In 1981, Freddie Records signed Selena y Los Dinos to a contract. They performed live before the album's release in clubs and fairs. The full-length album was finally completed in 1984. It was called Selena y Los Dinos, Mis Primeras Grabaciones. Unfortunately, the owner of Freddie Records did not believe the band was ready for a full-length album release, so Selena's father transferred them to Kara Records. There, they recorded Alpha, which was fully released without any repercussions. Munequito de Trapo was released in 1987, and the band began to gain notoriety. Selena was discovered by Rudy Trevino, who was founder of the Tejano Music Awards. It was then that Selena won Best Female Vocalist of the Year. She then won this award eight more consecutive times. Her band continued to produce and release albums over the years with a few labels. These albums included Dulce Amor in 1988, Preciosa in 1988, Selena y Los Dinos in 1990, Ven Conmigo in 1991, Entre a Mi Mundo in 1992, Selena Live in 1993, Amor Prohibido in 1994, and Dreaming of You in 1995. It was the song Ven Conmigo that really sparked their popularity, and Entre a Mi Mundo made Selena the first Tejana to sell more than 300,000 copies. One thing to note here, which was something I read and found interesting, was that Tejano music was a male-dominated industry. So, Selena recording Tejano music and gaining as much fame as she did was something to behold. Apparently, some venues even turned the band down because Selena was the lead singer. Even the studio EMI, which she had signed with in the late 80s, didn't seem confident that a Mexican-American woman would be able to have crossover potential, as she was doing both English and Spanish songs. But this didn't slow her down. Her brother, A.B., became her prime record producer and lyric writer for most of her career. She reached number seven on the U.S. Billboard Regional Mexican Albums chart with the song Sukiyaki, which was originally sung in Japanese in the 60s. She was later offered to be a spokesperson for Coca-Cola. And while she was gaining fame among those in the Spanish-speaking communities, her worldwide fame didn't really skyrocket until about 1993. Her album Live made number two on the Billboard's Top Latin Albums chart. She also landed herself on several television programs, with her introduction being the Johnny Canales show. In the early 90s, a man named Chris Perez had joined her band as the guitarist. They ended up 
finding a connection and decided to start a secret relationship since they knew her father would not accept it. When the father did eventually find out, he fired Chris from the band and referred to him as a cancer to the family. This didn't stop the lovebirds, however, who came up with a plan to elope on April 2nd, 1992. It worked out for the pair as Selena's father ended up accepting the marriage, so the two not only lived together, but worked together as well. And she gained even more success. What began as Selena's fortune was her contracts with DEP Corporation and AT&T and Southwestern Bell. The DEP Corporation, or Texas Commission on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, sponsored her, where she would tour and do educational videos. She also was involved in the D.A.R.E. program and worked with the Coastal Bend AIDS Foundation. If that weren't enough, she also made pro-education videos and made a public service announcement for a shelter for battered women in Houston in 1993. She released Baila Esta Cumbia along with a few other tracks in September of 1990. It was this song, however, that was one of her most successful singles. It was certified platinum by the Asociación Mexicana de Productores de Fonogramas y Videogramas. She won a Grammy for Best Mexican American Album for Live at the 36th Grammy Awards in 1994. She was the first female Tejano artist to achieve this. Now, this is the part of the story that is both incredibly tragic and sad. And it all begins with a woman named Yolanda Saldivar. Yolanda was born September 19, 1960. She was a registered nurse who had been a huge fan of Selena. After seeing her perform live in concert, she asked Selena's father, Abraham, if she could start a fan club in San Antonio, which he approved. He believed it would help with exposure. This took place in 1991. From here, Selena and Yolanda actually became friends. Yolanda became the president of Selena's fan club and was even hired to manage some of her boutiques called Selena Etc. that opened in 1994. She moved down to Corpus from San Antonio in order to be closer. Apparently, Yolanda even had a spare key to her house. It was around December of 1994 that the boutique's staff numbers decreased, causing the stores to suffer. Staff contacted Selena's father about Yolanda's behavior, and while he warned his daughter to be careful with Yolanda, she, according to one source, ignored his warning as she knew he had distrusted people in the past. Yet things were not as Yolanda portrayed. Selena's designer, Martin Gomez, who shared an office with Yolanda, ended up quitting because he found her so unpleasant. He said that she would steal, lie, and sabotage people's work. He also tried to warn Selena of Yolanda. And here is where things get messy and Yolanda gets crafty. So after Abraham receives phone calls from fans stating they had paid for a membership to the fan club and not received anything, he began to investigate. What he found was that Yolanda had been embezzling money, more than 30000 and I've read some sources that say as much as $60,000 from the fan club and the boutiques. On March 9, 1995, he confronted her at Q Productions with this information. He told her that if she couldn't provide proof to disprove this, that he would file a police report. He then banned her from contacting Selena. But Yolanda held on to bank records that Selena needed, and that was a crucial part in what was to come. About two days after being confronted by Selena's father, Yolanda went to a store in San Antonio and bought a 38 caliber revolver with 38 caliber hollow point bullets. While Selena was trying to obtain the financial records from her, Yolanda kept stalling, even going as far as to say she had been sexually assaulted in Mexico. Selena met her at a medical clinic on March 31st, 1995 to have her examined for assault. She was given an exam, but nothing gynecological, and was told to have an exam in San Antonio, since she was not a resident of Corpus, and the alleged assault took place in another country. They then returned to the Days Inn Hotel in Corpus, where an argument broke out about the documents. Yolanda pulled a gun on Selena at 11.48 a.m., who in turn tried to flee. But as she did so, Yolanda fired, hitting the singer in the back on the right lower shoulder and severing an artery. Selena ran, yelling, help me, help me, I've been shot, and leaving a trail of blood that was 392 feet long to the lobby of the hotel. Yolanda chased her and called her a B-word. Selena shouted to the staff, lock the door, she'll shoot me again, and then collapsed on the floor of the lobby at 11.49 a.m. The clerk called 911. 
Staff said Yolanda appeared calm as she finally stopped and returned to her room. Selena's final words were Yolanda, 158. She had given the name and room number of her killer. It took the ambulance a minute and 55 seconds to arrive, in which Selena had already went limp and had eyes rolled to the back of her head. They applied a Vaseline gauze that stopped the surface bleeding, but unfortunately her heartbeat was already very slow. A paramedic performed CPR to keep the blood circulating. According to Richard Fredrickson, a paramedic, he said it was too late when he got to the lobby. There was, according to him, a thick pool of blood from her neck to her knees all the way around on both sides of her body. He couldn't find a pulse. He could only feel her muscles twitch. When a paramedic tried to insert an IV, her veins collapsed because of the massive blood loss and little to no blood pressure. She arrived at Corpus Christi Memorial Hospital at 12 p.m. Her pupils were dilated, no evidence of neurological function, and no vital signs. She was declared brain dead. They got an erratic heartbeat and transferred her to a trauma room. They began a transfusion after opening her chest and finding massive bleeding. Her right lung was damaged, collarbone shattered, and veins were emptied of blood. Doctors began desperately trying to save her, according to cardiac surgeon Dr. Lewis Elkins. He said that Selena was contused and shredded, that the right side of her chest, all the tissue was ripped. He tried to massage her heart after it stopped. He also explained that the pencil-sized artery that goes from the heart had been cut in two by the bullet, so six units of blood from the transfusion actually spilled out from her circulatory system. She was given a breathing tube once she stopped breathing on her own. After just 50 minutes, the doctors knew that the damage was far too extensive. Selena was pronounced dead at 1.05 p.m. on March 31, 1995. She was only 23 at the time. Cause of death was blood loss and cardiac arrest. After an autopsy, it showed that the bullet went through the upper right back, passed through the chest cavity, and severed the subclavian artery. It took only a few minutes for basically all the blood to drain from her body after. The doctor said if it were only a millimeter higher or lower, it would have been less severe. Meanwhile, after the shooting, Yolanda had gotten in her truck to try and leave. Police discovered her and she backed herself up adjacent to two cars where police blocked her in. There, she held a gun to her right temple as she talked with police who had surrounded her. The standoff lasted hours with Yolanda claiming she shot her by accident and even threatening to unalive herself. Yolanda finally surrendered after over nine hours. Hundreds of fans were at the scene. Yolanda was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 30 years on October 26, 1995. She is serving her sentence in Christina Melton Crane Unit, Wants Gatesville Unit in Gatesville, Texas. Her eligibility for parole is on March 30th, 2025. So in an interview, Yolanda said that she was actually holding the gun to her own temple and that Selena had told her that I don't want you to kill yourself. And then Selena supposedly went to open the door and when Yolanda told her to close it, the gun went off. That's the story that she tells. Selena's funeral was held on April 3rd, 1995. This is a really sad story. Selena is a musical legend and one that I enjoy listening to. A film actually came out in 1997 about Selena and her life. It's starring Jennifer Lopez. I watched it a long time ago, but I think I'm going to actually watch it again. So with all that being said, that's the end of this episode. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you for joining me in the Barrens. Bye. Um, when they first told us that we were nominated, we all freaked out. Yeah. Um, we couldn't believe it. And the yeah. first thing I promise, the first thing that came to mind was like, I have to take a camera so I can take a picture with all these stars. Right. Yeah. And it, it didn't hit me later until yeah. like, oh my God, you know, what if we win or, you know? Yeah. And we went out there and they didn't let me take my camera in. That's one of the things. I didn't get to take any pictures till afterwards. But we were sitting there when they announced I had this huge knot in my stomach. I was so nervous. And then they announced the wiener. I mean, we all 